Hello everyone, welcome to Fishing the Podcast where we discuss modern's most competitive tribe and help the whole community become better merfolk players. <laughs> I'm Cody, one of the co-hosts of the show, and not Cody Smith on Twitter. And we also have, as always, my co-host, Matt. How are you doing, Matt? Actually, I'm pretty sad. Just uh, ended my vacation yesterday. Got home at midnight last night. Exhausted today. Have to work tomorrow. But I'm happy to talk cards. It's been a few days. It's actually been two weeks since we've talked cards. It, it actually has, now that I think about it. Yeah, we haven't done a podcast um, recording for two weeks. Now, I know we had an episode last week, but uh, anyone who listens got to hear me be uh, sick two weeks in a row. Uh, by the way, <laughs> feeling better? Uh, took about nine days for that uh, cold to go away, but uh, we're here. We're ready to go. Yep, so we are here to talk um, merfolk and merfolk accessories, just like we always are. And uh, yeah, so we're going to get right into it. Remember that you can support us uh, by f- liking our stuff and you know finding us on the various platforms and subscribing and uh, rating us with a five-star rating. That definitely helps us out a whole lot. So th- I'd prefer a six-star if you don't mind. Um, well, in most cases, uh, five stars is the, uh, the highest that you can go. No, just a lot of people don't know about this, but if you want to put a little extra oomph into your ratings... You can actually specially request a six star. Oh, well, I did not so know that. You should do that. Okay, six well, stars. Six stars. Okay. Yeah, definitely. I will. I will make sure to to note that in future <laughs> intros. Um, but but definitely uh, rating us, leaving reviews helps us helps push us up in the iTunes store, and uh, also following us on YouTube and uh, ringing the bell to become part of the the notification group, uh, part of the shoal, if you will, to. Uh, to know that uh, new episodes are there and around and you are able to get them as soon as they become available. If you would like to support us in a monetary fashion, you could uh, support us at patreon.com slash fishcastmtg where your hard-earned dollars help us, you know, pay for server costs, uh, pay for art from our great artist at Ishten uh, who has uh, lent us more artwork over the weekend. So thank you, Ishten, uh, for, for your great work. And yes, thank you. Thank yes, you. it is. It is going straight in. Everything is going straight into the show, and uh, I, I have a, <laughs> I have a few uh, Patreon dollars going in. You know, reserved for more stuff down the line. So believe me, cool things are coming, folks. We do appreciate your support. And I know we got a request for uh, T-shirts over the weekend. So what was we, funny? Cody so, and I have been talking about that. So we yes, we have been talking about it. But what was funny was I was talking. You know. Me and Ishton were, were had a DM going and and uh, we were actually talking about like what a logo for fishing would look like, you know, for play mats and t-shirts and whatnot. And while we were talking, somebody said, uh, where's the t-shirt? Where can I get this t-shirt? And it was just like serendipitous that just the, those two things happened at the same time. So yes, it is coming. I promise it's coming. And uh, it will be super awesome. And as cheap as possible. I think Cody and I discussed that we're not going to make any profit off these. Essentially, it'll be just kind of made to order and uh, whatever the cost of shipping plus the cost of the shirt is, is what we'll charge. So, yeah, we're going we're gonna to make it so that it is easy for people to uh, get a hold of. We, we want people to have them and, and share the love of Merfolk, you know, in their communities and FNMs. It'll be a thing of beauty. We're not here for the money. We're here for the sushi. Yes, sushi is pretty great. I'm not going to lie. Su- su- sushi is pretty delicious. Yes, it is, definitely. I think we're both on the same page there. No need to, you know, no need to add us. <laughs> sushi is delicious. Don't add us if sushi is not delicious. <laughs> All right. Hey, if you don't like sushi, that's fine. Yeah, I, f- I suppose you're okay with being wrong. Like, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of want to eel roll right now, by the way. Oh, yes. Pretty much any type of sushi would be muy delicioso right about now. Um, but let's go right into the random Murfolk card. And uh, I've got a really cool one here this week. I think this one, we haven't had an older card for some time. Like, that's actually a Murfolk. So, um, this one is We haven't had sweet. a Murfolk in a long time. That, well, that's what I meant, is like, we, <laughs> like even if it's been an older, like an, an older card, it hasn't been a Murfolk. So, this is an older card and a Murfolk. So, yeah, let's go ahead and get at it. Uh, do you want to read this one, Matt? Uh, sure. So this is uh, Marrow Grimeblotter, 
it is from Shadowmoor. So as everybody knows, this card is probably worth about $60,000 because everything in Shadowmoor is insanely expensive. So it is three of anything and a hybrid mana blue black for a creature merfolk wizard that is has the ability of one and one hybrid mana of blue black to and in the untap symbol and target creature gets minus two minus zero at the end of turn and it's a uh, two two so yes. it's it's fine <clears throat> the art is amazing oh the art is fantastic any any anything from the uh lorwyn or shadowmoor or the morning wood or any of those sets are just absolutely amazing morning tide i stand by what i said <laughs> <laughs> So, and I think we've talked about this before. I, we've hit a, quite a few merfolk with uh, the untap ability. The untap ability is just fantastic. I really wish they would go back to that. For uh, combo players, it is really, really fun because you, the way you can get things tapped is fairly easy. And just for kind of Johnny's and Jimmy's and Timmy's and Blimmy's and all the other funny, goofy names that Magic players give each other, I think that the untap ability has always just been a really cool way to build things out, especially, especially in EDH. Now um, this untap ability, not the best. I mean, I guess you can kind of technically, if you can kind of get it rolling in a comboing way, you could make all their creatures negative billions and whatever their toughness is. But well, I mean, overall it, it's fine. Th this card, you can, you can kind of tell that basically it's, it's primary use was in limited where you know you could give your merfolk island walk and then you know just kind of swing with impunity and then there was an island walk in lower one though was there uh there was there was a there was a few cards with island walk um there was also aquatex will that that turned a land into an island um i, I don't remember exactly if there was I, I would have to go back and look but one thing i will say now that you made me think about it is Time Spiral was the block before this. Mm -hmm. Lord of Atlantis was in Time Spiral. Mm -hmm. So technically, there was Island Walk. Okay, so I was right. I was right without, without having to double-check myself, which is for the limited, best kind of for right. For limited, you're kind of wrong, <laughs> because I don't think you would be mixing uh, Time Spiral and uh, <laughs> Shadow more together. Stop that. Stop that. <laughs> I'm just making sure everybody knows you're wrong. That's fair. That's fair. Um, but yeah. no, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, it is definitely a limited card. It's really cool, and um, I mean, I wouldn't play it now. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'd say you're right there. That's that's totally fair. It's definitely not something that I would put very much effort into playing in in I don't think any format. And I know I know that this was kind of part of that whole new world order where they were trying to reduce card complexity a bit. Um, but you're right. I think the untapped mechanic is definitely pretty chill. Yeah, and I think it'd be pretty safe to bring it back. When we go back to Lorwyn, whatever that may be, I'm sure they'll have to bring this one back. It, it, I know, especially in uh, the commander circles, it's a fan favorite. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, this is okay, not great. We're not, like, jamming this into decks, really. We're appreciating it for what it is, but we're not going to play it. We're going to admire it from afar. Yes. Kind of like what I do with Kate Upton and Cody Smith. <laughs> I'm glad to be in, in such a high company as Kate Upton. Hello, is it me you're looking for? <laughs> and uh, again, great art by I can see Cyril it in your Van Der Hagen. So the, I, I just love, I love the uh, Shadowmore Eventide merfolk uh, art, the Demir merfolk. They look great. Actually, you just zoomed in on it, and it looks even better than before. So that, that's really cool. The detail on that is fantastic. Yeah, oh yeah. No, it's, it's just beautiful art. Um, so I've got a few things to do before we go into our main topic. Uh, we are going to play an ad for Magic with Zuby. So that's coming up right now. Hey everybody, Zuby here to tell you about my Magic the Gathering podcast, Magic with Zuby. Magic with Zuby is a podcast all about the Magic the Gathering card game. We talk about the latest news and events, the latest cards and decks. We bring on guests from pro players to content creators and more. Join me each week as we keep discovering why Magic the Gathering is the best card game around. Coming back from the ad that we just played, that everybody heard except for us, 
because uh, it'll be added post. Uh, so I heard it. Go check out Magic with Zuby. He's I great. heard it in my soul. Yes. Actually, no, uh, everybody, please go listen to Zuby. Zuby's awesome. He's a friend of the show. Uh, we've been uh, communicating with him since we actually started, and we had like – Zero followers? Ne- negative zero followers. <laughs> ne- negative zero. <laughs> That's when Jess was like actively not listening to make us negative. Yeah. So now now just... my wife only passively doesn't listen. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um but I do have one more uh notification real quick. And that is it's it's super important to the life of this show. Oh birthday! It's Matt's birthday tomorrow. So Happy birthday, Matt. I'm going to be playing an annoying, super annoying. Oh, my, my wife snuck in to, to <laughs> clap and, and say happy birthday and make a funny face at Matt. So happy birthday, Matt. We appreciate you being on the show. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, birthdays uh, at this age are a little bittersweet. We are uh, <laughs> got a little bit of knee pain. Um, the gray hairs are coming in uh, at a little more high rate, but... Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I appreciate the birthday, love. I really do. Thank yes. you, guys. So uh, make sure to everybody to send annoying Facebook messages to uh, at Matthew Cotto 8. Uh, that's where you can find him on Facebook. If you send them to the Fishin at Fishcast MTG Twitter, I will forward them on with love. <laughs> I, I enjoy gifts. Yes. Uh, please send your finest gifts. <laughs> your finest gifts. <laughs> All right, so let's go to the main topic um, now that we've gotten past the uh, the, the pre-show stuff. And uh, we're actually kind of embarking on a new little series now, aren't we, Matt? Uh, yeah, we are. So this is actually something that Cody brought up uh, while I was on vacation. And while I was on vacation, I was uh, hammered most of the time. So he suggested this, and I just immediately agreed and forgot what he said until this morning when we talked about it again. So what we're going to try to start doing is uh, analyzing some of the individual cards within the Merfolk deck, uh, specifically the modern. We'll probably hit Legacy eventually, and uh, fingers crossed, uh, maybe even a standard deck if standard Merfolk becomes a thing after um, the evil decks that are about to rotate, rotate. And I think this was something that you saw on the uh, Merfolk subreddit, correct, Cody? Yeah, so I, I saw, and I wish I had the user up, up on top of me, uh, not a, not on top of me. Uh, ooh. Um, ooh. <laughs> ooh. Oh, my. <laughs> Smashing. <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, That's a Freudian slip. Yeah, of, of course, I, I've got the internet in front of me, and I could pull it up. But there was a user on the Merfolk subreddit that basically was kind of, you know, talking about what what they wanted to see in Merfolk content creation. And, of course, us being you know, on the pulse of Merfolk, you know, content and, and discussion on the internet, we waited several weeks to do anything about it. And here we are. <laughs> Which is what we do. Yes, yes. We are, we are hot on the tail of things that happened uh, seven to eight weeks ago. And uh, here we are talking about the individual Our Almond Cat review is coming, guys. Yep. <laughs> Three more months and we'll be talking about Almond Cat. Our uh, slow poke, um, I guess slow bro, because of the the, mer- the, you know, the the seashell on the back. I see what you did there. Yep. Yep. So uh, we are going to be talking about a fairly important version for both uh, the mono blue as well as swell folk, which is the blue green variation, and that is spreading seas. Yes, and actually, spreading seas is my favorite card in the entire deck. And uh, for those who have listened for a really long time. We had a buddy of mine who actually taught me how to play Magic uh, on the show a while ago. His name is Joe Burr, and when we talked about Merfolk, he mentioned that Spreading Seas is the best card in the deck, and I would tend to agree with him. So I think this is a perfect card to start and talking about when talking about uh, the cards that really make this deck run. And so one of one of the things that we are going to hit on, I mean, this card has basically a lot of uses, but the biggest thing is that. All of the uses are kind of like just a third of the reason that why we run it. And just having so many pieces of utility on the card makes it worth running. I think if any one of these pieces was missing, then like it would be a much worse card and we probably wouldn't be running it. It's almost like a mono blue command. Yeah. Except, for, except you don't have to pick one of the abilities that you should get all of them. Yeah, you just get all of them. And it but the thing is is just like you don't ever have a need for all three of them. It's just like 
they all just happen. The only complaint I have with this card is I want good spreading seas art. Sorry, Jung Park. I'm just not digging it. I mean, it's fine. It's boring. That's why I said it. it's it's just fine. Like I'm not I'm not in favor or get favor of or against it. It's just it's there. All right. So um, spreading seas is one in a blue for an enchantment aura. For those of you guys who didn't know, we'll, we'll go ahead and read it. Enchant land. Uh, when spreading seas enters the battlefield, you draw a card. And enchanted land is an island. Are we gonna do the flavor text? We got to do the flavor text. Most inhabitants of Zendikar have given up on the idea of an accurate map. That's good flavor text. Oh, yeah. No, it's great. I think it's great. And one thing of note is Spreading Seas actually, to this day, only has one printing. Original Zendikar, that's it. Yep, that's it. And, uh, yep, that is the only one, unfortunately. And basically, this, this deck has not been in Merfolk the entire entirety of its existence and you know it since it's been printed um but it did kind of I, I think it peaked mostly at you know the eldrazi winter you know when when we basically when the eldrazi decks had basically eight soul lands <laughs> and uh you were able to just kind of take out you know a lot of you know a lot of mana denial which is kind of one of the first things we're going to be talking about with this deck is um you know denying your opponent multiple sources of of, of colored mana so you know, reduce, or in the Eldrazi case, colorless mana. Or, or yeah, in, in the case of Eldrazi, which definitely isn't as big as it was, but, I mean, even with Tron, it, it reduces the... It cuts back on the amount of mana that their lands can produce. All right, we're, we're, we're in too deep. Let's, let's talk about mana denial. Yeah. And I, I, I think you're actually wrong. I think with the Eldrazi case, it still creates a huge problem for them because they do only have so many... Um, access or so much access to colorless mana in that deck especially some of the versions like bant eldrazi or the uh black white eldrazi and taxes so if you can knock them off of their colorless mana they're going to be really in trouble trying to play their thought not seers or the reality smashers or things like that so it, it, it goes without saying and it, and this is also applicable to any other like color deck like jund or uh, junk, or essentially any non-blue deck, or even blue decks that splash a different color, that if they are light on one particular color, and you can take that away from them, they become in a lot of trouble really quickly. Yeah, so I mean, to, to <laughs> first start to decks that, that produce more mana than one mana with each land, so Tron and Eldrazi are kind of the two, the two biggest offenders in this category. Um, like you said, it, it just shuts them off. Number one, it turns them off Tron. Um, but number two, you know, if you can bring them down from tapping for three mana to tapping for one mana, you are setting Tron, you know, and Eldrazi back a considerable amount. Now, when we talk about decks that are, you know, two and three colors, you know, maybe so like one example that I think is super, um, is super, uh, indicative of this problem is burn. So a lot of burn decks are not mono red. They are, um, they are Naya Naya burn, right? So so and they basically run like one stomping grounds and a couple sacred foundries, and so and there's a ton of fetches. Yeah, and a ton of fetches. So basically, it's like okay, they pay a fetch, right? They play a fetch, crack it, so they're down one. Then they put put in an untapped shock, so they've taken three damage to get this land into play, and they get one use out of it. Then you spreading sees it. So not only have you cut them off of an you know two colors, um, but you've <clears> cut them off of one a color that is maybe their only or limited source of that color. Um, but you've completely cut them off of the red, which is their their primary source that they need. So, you know, especially with their sacred foundries and their like you said, they usually have like one or two uh say, um stomping grounds, it's it's it can be crippling to them. No, absolutely. And actually, I think Black Red Hollow One falls into this category as well, as we've seen when we've play tested against each other, that the Burn deck and the Hollow One decks only play 18 to 19 lands, and many of those lands are fetches. So even though that, that one blue might not hurt them necessarily that much, the problem is, is that they're not going to be hitting 
a ton of land drops. So if you're effectively turning it into a colorless land, you can be shutting them off a, a single color very, very quickly. Yes, and and I, I totally agree with your point. And one other thing that kind of comes up is is even though you know in modern right now there's lots of two color decks around, but there also are an incredible amount of three color decks, which yep. is it's even more powerful against. And even like j- decks like Jeskai Control, um, yeah, Jund Junk, you know, like w- we're not you know uh, Mardu Pyromancer is, is huge right now as well, and that's that's another one that really gets hurt you know by mana denial. Um, we also have a lot of non-basics that don't produce colored mana that are very popular right now things like ghost quarter field of ruin and tech edge all see play in this format right now so i mean w- your your opponent often has the ability to destroy their own land that you spreading seized but if you're able to keep them off of you know uh field of ruin requires two extra mana so if you're able to seize their field before they're able to do anything with it you're effectively turning off removal number one for your for their for your spreading seas which we'll talk about later you know the benefits of spreading seas in combat but also because you know a lot of people use things like ghost quarter and tech edge and field of ruin to to tackle our man lands correct yeah and that's where i wanted to hit was the uh blue white control even though turning it into an island isn't necessarily going to hurt them because they play so many blue spells shutting off their celestial colonnades are huge yes Be, they, they play two to three and that is one of their primary win conditions. So if you shut off the colonnades, they're essentially down to ulting a walker to win the game. And that is going to become increasingly very, very hard for them. Uh, and then also the hardened skills decks with their Ink Moth and Blake Moth Nexuses. If you turn off the ability for them to hit with Infect, you're really shutting down a win con for them. Now, those decks have other ways around it. But still, when you're still denying them one piece of the puzzle, it becomes really hard. Yeah, so I mean, just like hitting our opponent's man lands is definitely important because man lands are a huge part of modern. If I mean, you know, this isn't a newsflash, I don't think, but you know, if you're if you're new to modern, you know, you're gonna see celestial colonnades, you're gonna see mutavaults, you're gonna see, um, and in in fewer cases, there's uh the red green uh um, <clears throat> savage. I forgot I I forgot the name of the red green one that that sometimes sees play in Jund. Um, oh, the uh, Rampaging Ravine, yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Um, so, so that one sees kind of fringe play, um, but you will see Mutavaults, and, uh, you know, in some matchups, uh, Fairy Conclave even comes into play. But the biggest, the biggest one is Celestial Colonnade, uh, and Creeping Tar Pits uh, are kind of the, the two biggest. So it, it's definitely important, mm-hmm. but as I said... Yeah, Tar Pits not so much anymore, because uh, Grixis Control has taken a pretty big step backwards. Yeah, but the the the, col- the colonnades the, the biggest one that's gonna the smack you that and the uh, the nexuses. But like I said, you know they're they're going to be using their ghost their ghost quarters and and other land removal to to hit our man lands. So we need to um, stop them from being able to do that, but also stop their man lands from being able to you know turn turn the corner and win the game. Um. So uh one one of the biggest things. Uh, the the other big thing to to note about enchanting your opponent's lands with spreading seas, um, number one, this does not change that they are. It doesn't change their super type basically. So they're so they're never going to be basic land island, which can which can matter, but it does change their type from you know land, uh, mountain forest into land island. It it completely removes all other types. Um, so this way, like if an opponent's playing with uh, Nykthos Shrine to Nyx for some reason and they they can basically play another Nykthos to bomb out the original um, so again doesn't change the super type, doesn't change the name, it only ta- changes the subtypes correct, and I believe that's the same with Blood Moon as well uh, yes I do believe so, so they're, they, they are non-basic lands become mountains but it doesn't change their super type correct yeah, because Blood Moon and Spreading Seas are very similar in the way they're designed. Yes, so so that is definitely something to consider. You know, if you're if you're playing against decks like that, it's definitely correct to take out lands like Nykthos Shrine to Nyx if you can, because if a deck's running Nykthos, like there's a reason they're doing it. You shouldn't you shouldn't ignore <laughs> you shouldn't ignore the amount of mana that that card can generate. But at the same time, it's something to. And consider. I'm assuming they're playing Stompy. 
Yeah, probably. <laughs> they're they're playing Carnage Tyrant. <laughs> yeah. Um. So uh, that that's something that we wanted to you know put out there as something to consider when you're choosing what land you should hit with your spreading seas. Um. So one. So another big thing in combat, at least, is it forces island walk. Now, right now in Merfolk, we have eight lords that give all of our Merfolk island walk, which is great. We also have four of Phantasmal Image, which is kind of a general thing that people are running now. Um, Sometimes that. The eight lords are bread and butter. The yes. Phantasmal Images come and go, and different decks are going to play different amounts. But you're, you're going to have a minimum of eight, maximum of 12. Yes. And, and so basically what this causes is it forces island walk on our opponents, even if they don't have basic islands. Which is a big thing right now because there's not many decks that are playing islands right now. I think blue black control or blue black control. I think the Azorius uh, control are probably the only deck that you can expect to see having some sort of either basic island or uh, dual land island in it right now. Well, there's also Jeskai control, which still sees play. And uh, but you're right, there there aren't a whole lot of um, blue based decks right now. There's a lot of uh, black and black X decks that are kind of. Um, dominating the format so well and humans doesn't really play any islands mm -hmm. I, i'm looking at the uh mtg goldfish modern metagame right now and in, in the top decks i'm seeing right now i mean bant spirits and blue white control are the only main ones that i'm seeing where you're going to see any islands yeah so th so this is basically like forcing evasion into our deck which is excellent because honestly this can this <laughs> this as a top deck can win you the game you know, if, if you if you're just sitting there and you you drop a spreading seas and you you've got a you know a board of like 10, 12 power, guess what? You're you're turning the you're turning the corner on this game, and there's no way people can get get back from that usually. Absolutely. So with with the lack of islands in the modern meta game right now, one of the things that we've talked about in a previous episode is what holds Merfolk back from humans and spirits right now is the lack of evasion. So we absolutely need to have that island walk online to get our pumped up fishy friends through to deal maximum damage. So not having the spreading season, not turning something into an island, it can be a huge deterrent. Uh, for example, Tron. If you don't have an island out there against Tron and they have a worm coil, that's game over. Because every time you attack in, you're gonna, your creature's going to die, and they're going to gain six life before you deal any damage. So if anything, it's going to be a wash or, you ascend, or just you doombladed yourself. Yeah, so the so you're right. Like you know, against too big of a creature, I mean, sometimes by late game, uh, you you have you know you have a master waves down, so you have a fairly wide board, but that doesn't always mean that you know right away you're going to win the game. But if you make everything basically unblockable, then guess what? There's no way your opponent can interact with that, in, except for you know ghost quartering themselves or or something along those lines. And uh, you know what? Sometimes that's enough to just take the game, and, and that's kind of what we want. And I mean, if they ghost quarter themselves, I mean, they're blowing up two lands. Yeah, and so... I mean, so, they're, they're, get, they're getting one back, but still. Yeah, but they, they're still setting themselves back. So even, even in that case, like, they're behind uh, kind of in a similar way that you're behind now that you don't have the island walk. Yeah, but again, I mean, they're getting one back, but like in Tron's case, if they ghost quarter a Tron piece to prevent the island walk from going through at best they're getting back a basic forest <laughs> so yeah it's it's not a good situation for the tron player if that's what's going on if they things have gone things have gone really bad if they haven't already gotten their basics out i mean tron i think runs like one or two forests uh they run up to like four to five now in the mono green version okay so it just depends but yeah it's just and i've done it before i've ghost quartered myself before to prevent the island walk so i can throw some blockers in front of them yeah, it's it, it can be rough. No, and I mean you do it if you have to, but you really don't mm -hmm. want to be in that spot. Um, so one other thing that that's kind of important is drawing a card. It replaces itself. I think this is what actually puts the card over the top and makes it the best card in the deck. I mean, one, it is the engine that keeps it going because it make, gives your guys evasion. It does produce the mana denial, but the fact that it does all of that and replaces itself is absolutely amazing. Because yes, you don't so, you don't lose gas by going forward with this card. Yes, yeah, so so we're gonna talk about it here in a little bit with its relation to uh, Aether Vial as kind of a like you know a quote unquote mana source. Um, but 
you know, this along with Silver Go Adept being able to have eight cards that replace themselves in your deck is pretty sweet. So not only is it a win condition in of itself, like, you know, being able to just rush past all of your opponents, but just being able to draw cards. So like early game, you don't have a whole lot of threats, you know, drop your spreading seas to, to draw into stuff. Late game, you draw spreading seas, it's not the end of the world because guess what? You drop that spreading seas, you're, get, you're getting a fresh card. So and there's... I, well, and unlike most blue decks, you're not cantripping a lot in Merfolk. You're not playing your... I want to say ponder, but that's a legacy. You're not playing. Serum visions. Serum visions. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. This is definitely vacation brain. Yeah. So you're not, you're not playing serum visions. You're not playing opt. You're not playing slide of hand. So you're not circling through a bunch of cards. Now you are drawing cards of silver gill and you're drawing cards with your spreading seas. So that's eight possible card draw engines that you have. But in the large scheme of things for blue deck, it's really not that much. And with the fact that you're playing a creature-based blue deck, you are you are burning your hand out a lot more than you would be in a control-type deck. So having that replacement effect is completely massive. If anything, you're, the worst card you're going to be drawing is either an Aether Vial or an Island, and at least you're not drawing it during your next um, draw step. And then hopefully you're going to be drawing into Gas, which you can play either immediately off your Aether Vial or just hard cast with the man yeah. that you have left over. So so you you touched on basically the point that I wanted to touch on is that blue creature deck. Right? So basically every mono blue list runs around 30 creatures. Sometimes a little bit less, sometimes a little bit more, but the big thing is, you know, if you're running 30 creatures and 20 lands, that does not leave you a whole lot of space for for non-creature spells. And if four of those are spreading seas and four of those are aether vials, you je- you definitely don't have enough space for anything else. So yeah. it's it's really important that you know we have things like spreading seas to kind of help us dig past dead spots. So you know extra lands. You know after after the f- you know third land, you're really not looking for a whole lot more than that. And so it's kind of one of those things that if you get stuck in a land pocket, it kind of helps pull you through that a little bit. And at least you know maybe you can you can kind of get through and, and maybe even into more creatures. I mean, in, in my guess is that if in Return to Lorrowin we got a better Silvergill Adept, Silvergill Adept would not be replaced in this deck. If anything, we'd just be playing fewer of them. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, again, Silvergill Adept is great for that reason, that it, it's, it's a body that gets pumped off of Landwalk and, Landwalk and just the Lords, but it replaces itself. So Spreading Seas is great for that. Yep. Um, so so kind of like the, the, the fourth slash fifth use of Spreading Seas is Devotion. So despite... Cody, what's Devotion? I don't so, know what this mechanic is. <laughs> so Devotion, or its original uh, incarnation was Chroma, um, is basically... Your mom's a Chroma. Oh! a chroma <laughs> that would be that'd be uh I, i'd have a, a few other things to uh to to wonder about in my life if, if my if my mother was an angel um however comma uh devotion is basically this it che- you know devotion checks how many of each hip of each color you have so we have a really big card in our deck that requires not requires but becomes better with more devotion and that is the master of waves so, uh, when Master of Waves enters the battlefield, you get X, uh, one, zero elemental creature tokens equal to your devotion to blue. So, we have lots of blue pips in this deck, being a mono blue deck. We have, you know, two just from our lords, so there's a, there's a source of two. Um, we have Silvergill, we have, you know, um, we have a couple from Harbinger of the Tides and even Merfolk Trickster now. So, so there's lots of ways to get your devotion up, but another sneaky way to get your devotion up is with spreading seas. You know, it just kind of it's something that that you play, and it's a little bit harder to remove than a creature, so it it has you know more uh, ways to stay together, you know, or stay on the field. And guess what? It's just an extra it's an extra uh, elemental token for you. 
And it's going to cause the feel bad for your opponent because more often than not, when they miscount your devotion, it's going to be because they forgot that they have the spreading seas on their land and that counts too. So you're going to be like, I have six seahorses. They'd be like, uh uh, you got four, jerk. And then you're like, spreading seas twice. And then they cry. And then you laugh at them. Yep. And then you win. Hopefully you win. That's that's kind of the plan. You win. <laughs> you you really hope to that when you cast your master waves that that's the thing that wins. But but in a, in all seriousness, you know, having an extra one or two, you know, uh, two ones or or an extra three or four can be what wins you the game. You know, just going wide enough sometimes is what kills them. No, absolutely. Now, Cody, on a more important note, every time we say master waves from here on out, can we get the master master from Metallica? Afterwards. <laughs> I'll have to I'll have to find that and I'll and I'll, I'll, I'll I'll do my best to 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 cut that out and put it in the show. Just, just, just save that like a little audio file somewhere so every time we can hear uh, James uh, whatever the hell his name is, uh, <laughs> I want to say James Hagrid but that sounds wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's He's... James Hagrid though. Excuse me, who are you? Rubius Hagrid. You're a wizard, Harry. <laughs> um yeah but I just, want, I just want to hear him yell about master of waves so so the last thing that we really, really want to talk about is you know one thing that that it does not do very well is it doesn't commit to our board very well like we don't you know aether vial is kind of a is kind of a side thing that that kind of generates mana for us in the long run because we can use it to put our creatures into play uh while Spreading Seas does replace itself, it doesn't help us cast our creatures or anything like that. We're basically paying two mana to effectively draw a card the turn we play it. Aether Vi- or Aether Vial. Uh, Spreading Seas is, is an odd case because if you're playing against a deck that already has an island in play or you already have played at least one Spreading Seas, late game, it becomes the third worst draw on your deck. Because you don't, you're the worst draw is the Aether Vial because it's absolutely useless. Then the second worst would be a land because by late game, you already should have your land base. And then again, if they already have an island, so your island walks already invoked, then Spreading Seas becomes a really, really bad draw. It essentially is two mana draw a card. So on the counter argument to that, if you don't have island walk um, activated, late game and you're need that just to win it becomes the best draw but more often than not you're probably going to have some sort of island on your opponent by that point yeah so so the point i was making is is when you're looking at your opening hand right and let's say you have two lands an aether vial a spreading seas and any two creatures right you're in a very good spot because let's say you know you did go, you mulligan because that's only six cards. Well, that's six cards? Okay, so three creatures <laughs> then. So you have like a Silvergill, a Trickster, and a Lord, right? So like that would be almost a perfect hand. I can't count. Don't, don't at me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but so in this case, you know... Hashtag math is hard. Yeah, math is, math is hard. Um, I'm, a, I'm a college student, darn it. <laughs> but uh, so, so, you know, it's like you... You know, you, it does seem like you're taking a lot of turns off because you're going... Land Aether Vial, right? But then you're going turn two spreading seas? Or do you spreading seas? Because if you have action in your hand, if you have creatures like a silver gill or a lord, maybe you wait on the spreading seas because it's not quite what you need to get there. So I would definitely hold it in that situation. Now if we're looking at a hand that's you know a little bit more land heavy or a little bit more vile heavy, then that's something that you can do to kind of help draw you past not having action in your hand um so it's it's definitely worth it's it there's a whole bunch of different cases where you know we could go hand by hand i'm sure and just kind of go like you should do it in this order you should do it in that order but generally what you should do with with spreading seas is play it early if you know what your opponent's playing and you can disrupt their mana um but you should play it later if you have action because you want to get creatures on the board you know well, you, then it- it also depends on the deck you're playing against, because if you're playing against Tron, you need to play Spreading Seas probably on turn two, if you're, especially if you're on the draw, because Tron's more often than not going to have it on 
turn three or turn four, depending on how they start playing. And again, that's where knowing your meta and knowing the decks that are being played it becomes very, very important. Because you can tell, again, let's use Tron as a good example. You can tell a Tron player if they're going to hit on turn three. There's a lot of cues that you get. They play a expedition map on turn one, or they have cracked a egg into a ancient stirrings and they've taken a tron piece and they already have one tron piece so you, you can kind of figure out like okay it looks like they're about to hit on turn three so you, you need to play that spreading seas on turn two because if they if they get that karn down or worm coil or whatever you're you now are in a lot of trouble yeah and and again like like matt said you know if if you see you know urza's mind <laughs> tap for expedition map then you know get your get your C's ready cuz this is something that's that's coming down and it's definitely important because you know there you might be playing against um like a, a mono green deck and it might not be as important to get spreading C's down at that point i don't know of a mono green deck currently in the meta but you know at you know at, at your local fnm you know or somebody you know somebody plays a starts off with a basic land it's kind of like eh, this isn't quite as you know urgent yeah. So like on the flip side, like blue, uh, white, blue control, most likely I can see you probably boarding your spreading seas out, but on game one, you're probably going to want to hold on to those for a while and get your action in play and just hit the colonnades later because yes. the colonnade takes forever to activate anyway. And at that point, and you want to make sure you hit those <laughs> colonnades because if they, if they're controlling the board and they, they counter that and they get the colonnades going, you can be in a lot of trouble very, very quickly. Yes, definitely. Um, this is and, also. And, sorry, go oh, ahead. I was going to say also, and w w w agreeing with your point too is like so. Let's talk about Jund or Burn. Well, Burn's a bad example, but Jund, Abzan, in uh, any of those kind of three, two, three color decks. If you wait a turn or two, you can kind of see what color of mana they're most light on, and then that's the point when you can choke them out of that color of mana and really put a stranglehold on the game. Yeah, because that's that's one thing. Like you know, if they play fetch into shock, and then next turn they play a shock of the same color, then maybe maybe like let's say they go you know um, bloodstain mire into sacred foundry, and then next turn they play sacred foundry. Maybe they're not so high on black mana, so maybe that's that can be kind of an indicator. Like hey, maybe I should hit the next black source that comes down. <laughs> and so that's, exactly. something, that's something that, I mean, it's kind of a more nuanced play, but it's something that, like, if you're paying attention, you can definitely just get them. And it feels so good to get them, for sure. And remember, only true Gs play spreading Cs <laughs> on fetch lands. Yep, and uh, <laughs> you just don't care. You just don't care. You just don't care. Just force them to take the extra damage. <laughs> that would actually be really funny to get somebody down to one and then spreading seize their fetch land and just like see if they see if they fall for it. Just <laughs> that, that's that's a Merfolk achievement. If you find if you've done that on Moto or on in paper, please send us video proof of it, and uh, we will send you something nice. Uh, it'll be that's I want to see that now. <laughs> Actually, my favorite uh, MTG Goldfish video that I ever saw, and I can't remember which one it was, but Seth was doing some shenanigans like he always does. And Seth doing shenanigans? Yeah, yeah Saffron Olive. Ugh. Also known as Saffron Olive. Yeah, he was doing shenanigans. He was kind of doing this combo thing. Not also known as Saffron Olive. Better yeah. known as Saffron Olive. Better known. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> but anyway, he thought he, his opponent conceded uh, match one. So our... I can't remember what it was, match one or the game or whatever. So he got up and walked away and then he came back and he, I think he timed out or something. He, he didn't realize that he had actually um, killed himself by shocking himself or uh, by fetching too many times. <laughs> so apparently it was like back in uh post that he actually noticed that he had killed himself doing that. <laughs> That's awesome. So, so it, it, throughout the rest of his video, he had to have these like word disclaimers come up. It's like, I still don't know that I killed myself. I don't understand why this game is ending like this now. I think M Moto is screwing up. That's funny. Well, you know, that's uh, that's that's uh, Saffron Olive to a T, though. I mean, I, I'd expect nothing less. Exactly. If anyone could kill themselves and not know how they did it, 
it, it has to be him. Exactly. <laughs> um, so make sure to uh, talk to us on on Twitter at, at @fishcastmtg and and uh, you know shoot your your questions out to us because the only way we become better as a group is by you know asking questions and honestly. If you have a question, probably somebody else has the question. And if my kids were old enough, they would tell you that the thing that I say all the time is the answer is always no if you don't ask, ask the question. I'm sure my kids would probably be annoyed by it if they if they could remember things past five minutes. But it's, The so, thing I always tell my kid is sit down and shut up. Yeah. Well, so <laughs> ask the question because we're, we're always happy to answer. You can ask at FishCastMTG on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And uh, you can also find us... Uh, I'm personally on Twitter as at not Cody Smith and Matt, where can we find you? I'm at Matthew Caudill eight. I've drawn a line in the sand. I am officially saying that this is the best card in the deck is the most powerful card in the deck. Let me know what you think. Am I spot on? Am I full of garbage? Let me know. We'll have to uh, put out a, uh, a poll on the Twitter and see, see what people think because it's definitely a very good card. And as we said, you know, we, we, we don't have to convince you. We just talked for 30, 30 minutes about it. But so, yeah, let us know what you think about Spreading Seas. And uh, remember, if you have a long form question, you can email us at fishcastmtg at gmail.com. Our cover art was made by Tessa and Hunter Pruitt. And our stream overlay art and emotes and uh, all sorts of other great art was done by at Ishton on, uh, on Twitter. Uh, make sure to go find him. He did lots of art for Cardma Jigs as well as Channel Fireball. So he's a great artist. Go find him. He does great stuff. And I'm going to sneak in one final point. If Spreading Seas didn't exist, the deck would actually be dead now and unplayable. Have a good night, everyone. podcast where we discuss modern's most competitive tribe and help the whole community become better firm help the community become more firm <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hell yeah we are <laughs> <laughs>